Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. As we all know, modern teams require modern solutions, and a pain point for many distributed teams for many years has been related to things like company credit cards, budgeting, and expense tracking. But this has all been solved by the team over at Ramp. With Ramp, I can issue virtual or physical company credit cards for anyone on my team in just a few clicks. I can actually assign those individual cards their particular limits and rules and track expenditures seamlessly all in the Ramp system. You can assign as many cards as you'd like, pay for transactions around the world in multiple currencies and manage your budget all in one place. I really do think Ramp might be my favorite new tool to emerge in the past few years, and I have no idea how I'd work without it anymore. Create an account in minutes and get a free $500 Ramp bonus when you spend your first $1,000 via the About Abroad affiliate link in the show notes. My guest today is Rowena Hennigan. She's the founder of Row Remote and was also named one of the top 25 remote innovators in 2021 by remote.com. She's an educator, founder, lecturer, course author, digital nomad, keynote speaker. She's a little bit of everything wrapped up into one that this show is all about. And I was so happy to finally get her on the show. Um, But not only all that, not only the work that she does and the advocacy that she does for the remote work movement, she's also practicing what she preaches. She lives in Spain a few hours up the road from me. And she talks us through what it's like being a young family, having kids, adapting to a new culture, a whole new country, learning the language, getting the kids into school, all of that fun stuff that holds a lot of people back from traveling and making a life for themselves overseas. Rowena dives right into that for us. She also shares why she chose Zaragoza and Spain. And we have a lot of fun talking about some of the reasons that we love living in this country. So... I hope you'll have a good time listening to Rowena. She's a lot of fun. Her Irish accent's just wonderful to listen to. And she's got so much great information to share. I had a real blast talking with her. So please help me in welcoming Rowena to About Abroad. I'm already loving this conversation, Rowena, and I, we're only three seconds in, but we, you know, just the little bit of chit chat we had backstage before we're going, this is, I just know this is going to be a really fun hour. Yeah, it's super to finally connect. We feel like we know each other, don't we, Chase? Maybe it's because we're in Spain together. We're both nomads, all that good stuff. And of course, we love remote work. <laughs> so it's, it's so nice to finally connect and get this recorded. It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, there's social media and, and the digital world we live in. It's like a big world, but it's a small world too. And we we cross paths quite a bit in the uh, in the digital world. And so putting a face with the name and, and having a quote unquote in real life conversation is, is always a great pleasure. Totally. Totally. <laughs> How are things in Zaragoza right now? For, for those that don't know you're in Zaragoza, I'm in Val- Valencia. We're what about three hours apart? Three, three, four hours apart, depending on how, whether if you can move between the regions at the moment, Jason, and how I decide to actually travel. Yeah. Zaragoza, Zaragoza is an amazing place. Zaragoza is not that well known, fifth biggest city in Spain and near the Pyrenees, hour and a half from the French border. And myself and my family are celebrating, just recently celebrating our fourth year here. Wow. So we moved on the 2nd of April from Dublin here. And uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we were so happy to find Zaragoza. It's our home. My daughter has been living more in Spain than in Ireland, so she considers herself Spanish. She's totally bilingual, and yeah, we're 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 very happy to 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 be based here. We are location independent. Uh, <laughs> we'll come on to that in a while, but yeah, this is our this is our default home that supports us, and we love it here. Wow, how did you find Saragossa out of just or, or actually? Let's back up. 
how did you choose Spain or did Spain choose you? And, and then within that Zaragoza, did you, did you check out other cities or did you land there and just love it? Or what was that process like? It's kind of interesting because when, when I first started nomading back in 2007, around the same time I was remote working to give you a context or first remote working, I just moved around for pleasure. I was single. I was young, footloose, fancy, fancy free, visited different countries, Southeast Asia, did a little bit of that for a while. But uh, 10 years ago, when I came back to Ireland and met my partner and had my daughter, I had my daughter a couple of years after that, you know, you're thinking of settling down, you're a family, you've got a small baby. And uh, yeah, we, we were kind of settled in Dublin until around 12, 14 months in. Unfortunately, my daughter develops chronic asthma. And this is part of the story because the original nomading was for fun, for choice. And then suddenly we, you have a very sick child in a very damp climate. Mm. So Ireland's very, very damp. And we, we had to find Zaragoza. That's yeah. the answer. We yeah. had to find somewhere with dry climate. It became non-negotiable because, frankly, after a year of a child being very, very sick at night and with very little sleep, a small child, you, you, you start to get desperate. But we were desperate with options because, fortunately, and through both me and my partner's work, we both worked remotely and could work remotely. And the university I'm still attached to were letting me work from home when I could because I was getting so little sleep at night. So it became, Zaragoza was found out a necessity. And what happened was my partner's role at the time, there was a satellite office in Zaragoza, there was in Ber- one in Berlin, there was a few other options in Europe. But we visited Zaragoza and went, this is wonderful. And that's why we chose Zaragoza, because we visited it and, and it ticked a lot of the boxes. So in terms of picking a place, and we can maybe discuss this in a while, we had very key criteria and integration was really important to us. And Zaragoza really met that in mm. terms of the opportunity to integrate. Integrate into the culture, the, the local yeah, culture. Yeah. yeah, because it doesn't have many expats. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a local town for sure. Exactly. So it'd be interesting to see comparing that with Valencia because mm-hmm. Valencia was on the list, but... Someone who I already spoke uh, nearly three languages when I came here, and I now speak oh, wow. Spanish. What, what, which languages? So, so I uh, speak English, obviously. Oh, you speak it quite <laughs> well for an Irish person. <laughs> Irish English, Irish English. I speak Gaelic or Gaelic, Irish Gaelic fluently, bilingually. Um, my grandparents only spoke that oh. to me when I was young. Slancha, um, maybe. <laughs> Uh, which means thank you in Irish. Oh. I learned German to a good level, probably intermediate uh, while living in Munich. And I would have said I was quite good, maybe me- intermediate than that. Now, what's interesting about bringing in Spanish in your 40s? <laughs> <laughs> it is a, there's that, a difference there too. Like that's not a, that's, that's a real thing. <laughs> exactly. Age, man. That's yeah. a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> But what happened, what I found was, as I was pushing, and you literally have to push it in, pushing the Spanish in, forcing it in, the German, even some of the Gaelga, the Gaelic started to drop out. So I would say now that I speak three languages as well. I think, I mean, I've loved learning Spanish. It's been fantastic. I've even started delivering in Spanish in my work, which I'm so proud of. Wow. But yeah, I did a, I did a, a session, a live session a few weeks ago in Spanish which was a major life goal and achievement for me. But that's one of the main reasons we picked Zaragoza, because we knew that we would have to speak Spanish. Yeah, yeah, you do. That's that's so important, too. If you really want to dive into the culture, like avoiding that place where all the expats go is super important. And and so, yeah, you, you found that. And in a beautiful, I mean, the, not on top of all that, I'm curious to hear more about the criteria, but I mean, Zaragoza is a beautiful town, got one of the most gorgeous cathedrals and main squares in all of Spain, close to the Pyrenees. You mentioned the French border. I'm, I'm a mountain person personally, so it's kind of weird that I live in Valencia on the Mediterranean because really I'm, I'm from the, the mountains and I love, I crave the mountains. That's where I escape to. So I pass right through Zaragoza and always stop in Zaragoza on my way to and from the Pyrenees here in Valencia. So I, it's got a special place in my heart too. 
Yeah, and like that, I mean, we just came back. We were there when the, the, the restrictions opened up here a little bit. Off we went to Biesca's last weekend. We were doing hiking oh. in the mountains there. It's just stunning. But that was on the list, okay? So the integration for language was there. The 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 um, access to the Pyrenees. Interesting you say you crave the mountains because I'm a snowboarder. I've done seasons. I actually seasoned in France, season aired in France, remote working many when I first was nomading uh, from the different stories. And I was working in the mornings and snowboarding in the afternoon. So snowboarding myself and my partner, big passion. Our daughter can ski now. She's really good. She overtakes me on the slopes. So we have access to Andorra, to the French uh, slopes. We have access to, obviously, all the, the Spanish slopes. And actually, it's been a bit of a coup because my partner managed to go to the one open slope a few weeks ago in Astun. Oh, <laughs> and, really? Yeah, the only other open slopes. I think there's one in Russia and one in Sweden. There's very few. So he got to do two days a few weeks ago. I was very, very, very jealous of him. But, you know, life's what you make it that way. And when we had our list, we said, we're moving with a sick child. We're moving. We're leaving all our family support. Um, it wasn't easy, but we both lent into having lived in other countries before. And I just said to myself, she's asthma. She has fluid on her chest. That's essentially what asthma is. We go somewhere dry and it will help. So, that, mm. of course, that was the main driver because we were quite desperate at that point to help her health. But also underneath that was the life experience and the knowledge that with our checklist and with the values to be to integrate as much as we could, but also to be mobile, mm. to, but also to be mobile. Because the values of nomads at heart, I think when you write them down and you look at them, they're your reference points. They're yeah. your compass for how you want to live. And so... When we got here, you know, we knew we had to do Spanish classes. We knew we had to learn about culture. Um, we knew it was going to be hard, but she slowly stopped coughing. Oh. She slowly imp improved. And, and, and when you're a bit of a risk taker, which we definitely are, I am, and as a family, you know, we are, it, some, it pays off. Fortune favors the brave. You just have to go for it. And when you have a child then that suddenly starts sleeping through the night, you go, yeah, yeah, this was all worth it. Absolutely. Wow. I, I'm super happy to hear that, uh, that this experiment worked and that, and that trading Dublin for Spain has been a positive move uh, health-wise for your daughter first and foremost. But it also sounds like it's just been an incredible, cultural, fun, exciting experience. And I think... You know, actually, it's it's really kind of interesting because we're going to get into your your remote work advocacy and and everything that you do there because that's equally as incredible. But it really it, this this kind of connects those dots for me in my mind because I recall in high school I had our I believe he was our athletic director and he was a football coach and a teacher and he was such a great guy. He was married and his wife I never met his wife. His wife lived in Florida because she had asthma. And I'm just kind of connecting these dots right now as you're telling the story, because this was not a possibility. What you're doing now is not a possibility then, or at least it was very unheard of. She had to live in Florida and he had to live 14 hours away in, in North Carolina. And, uh, and, and they couldn't be together because she had asthma or he would have to give up his career. And it was a, maybe at some point he did, but at least for a couple of years, they lived separately. And, you know, it's just amazing how far technologies come and how the opportunities have changed and remote work provides so many fun and exciting opportunities people can nomad and travel and live where they want but sometimes it's it's providing like life changing like real out of necessity kind of life changes and that's what's really incredible about it and I, that probably weighs into why you're such a, a big advocate for this movement exactly and when i look at the sustainable development goals and relate them to how remote work can support definitely 11 or 11 of those but you know 14 in theory of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. One of them was equality, Chase, mm -hmm. okay? And for me, being able to keep in the workforce by being able to, to actually come to Spain, start my business, keep working because my, my daughter's health improved, remote work provided that, and particularly as a woman, yep. this is all weaved in there. So my passion for remote work is really personal. Mm -hmm. And the independent 
living location, the ability to move on top of that. It's just the icing on the cake. And, and that is why I can, I can have the energy. I can, I can relate to my values each day because there is this story of, oh, being a nomad and remote working when I was working for a big telco in 2007, this is fun. This is great. I'm young and I'm that <laughs> nomad on the beach, yeah. on the beach <laughs> which is the cliche, isn't it? You know, it is. It's the stereotype. I mean, it is. You posted that picture from the beach in Valencia and I was like, there you go. There's the stereotype. <laughs> but, but, but it's so true and it is quite serious that when for certain reasons like illness and families, like uh, whatever, when it becomes a necessity, it's different. It gets even more personal because that's why now I'm like, everyone needs to realize these benefits. And we're also helping the planet as much as we can Mm-hmm. by you know and also the fundamental quality of life for my daughter was changed and and for me that's you know that's that, that's really really important and it's a lesson to her growing up hopefully as well of how to live and how to think and how to be gentle as we live on this planet because that's a big part of why we do what we do absolutely and then on top of all that think about the education that she's getting she's how old already she's how old <laughs> She's seven. She's seven, she's seven, and she's already bilingual. She's got seven. experience skiing and snowboarding in the yeah. Pyrenees. Yeah. Lived in another country. Mm-hmm. You know, has two parents that have traveled around and seen so much of the world. I mean, that they you know they say like travel is the the greatest form of education, and like she's been inundated with that at seven years old, and and that's that's an incredible opportunity that will pay dividends throughout her life. So it's exactly. it's really incredible. It's- Exactly. And she also the other day was saying when she talks about Ireland, she understands the reasons why we move to make life better, to help her health. So I think even that is a life lesson. Mm. Um, and again, maybe it's for, for people from different parts of the world. And Europe is quite warm like that. I don't know if you've found that, but we feel a connection in Europe to each other. I do feel European. I feel like a global citizen, but I do feel European and I feel very open about moving around Europe quite easily. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Chase, yeah. does it? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I even yeah. feel as an as an outsider, as a non-European, I feel yeah. very I, there's a there's a general sense of of open arms and like uh there's not such a strong concern about your like national nationality and background because so many it's such a melting pot of different cultures and i mean that the history within europe is all these borders being shared and and people coming from different backgrounds and now that you can pass through so easily um there is just a sense of like we welcome you (laughs) exactly exactly and then that mindset as well that mindset what's interesting actually i'll give you a little story that is interesting what's interesting is this last year 14 months with the pandemic and to contextualize everything we were actually in Ireland when the lockdown started in Spain. We actually had gone home for a family wedding. And when we got the flight back into Madrid and got on the bus to Zaragoza back on the 15th of March, it was the last flight back in. All the flights were stopped from Dublin to, to, to Madrid. And um, we came back to a ghost town in Zaragoza. And suddenly, like this last 14, 12, it's been the best and the worst of my life, personally, <laughs> because suddenly everything I knew about remote work, I was in this 70 meter apartment, couldn't come to my co-working with my daughter, who's fabulous and lo- I love, but was crawling all over me, you know, all day long. And suddenly everyone wanted advice on remote work. For, it was, and both myself and my husband were like, hang on, we came to Spain to live outdoors, to be on our terraza, to be in the parks, which is a massive, I mean, the culture for outside is amazing here. And we couldn't go out. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'm laughing now, Chase, but there was a lot of crying during those oh, four yeah. months, you know? So, so that, what's interesting is once the things, once the restrictions relaxed here in June, and this might make you smile, what do you think we did? We got the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> we, we, I had a friend with an apartment in Tarragona. My, our daughter finished homeschooling and we went. And we spent two and a half months in Tarragona. We used a local co-working. She went into a local summer camp that happened to be, you know, presencial in person. Wow. Stuff was still locked down in Zaragoza. So we were so lucky. 
But that flexibility of not having a mortgage, not having strong ties, nearly always having the bags packed, which is going to sound weird to some people, but we do. Like I have a travel pack in my bathroom, which, you know, is just all small things ready to go. For that example. way you don't have to pick up all, like remember the toothbrush. <laughs> Those are the little things that will keep you from going, right? Like, oh, I have to get my... My, you know, my things together. If you've already got those things set, you just, you're ready to go when you, when the mood strikes you. Yeah. And that little example of being able to get out of Zaragoza uh, for two and a half months. And meanwhile, there was another lockdown. We got back again in September. It's just, you're fortuitous if you set it up. You're fortuitous and you can take those opportunities as a family as no matter who you are, no matter what age, that's what I want to put across. It's a mindset shift. And the more you do it, the better you become at it. Yeah. Does that make sense as well? Because you just, you, you just go, why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. You become accustomed to it and you you're, you can anticipate the, the potential low points and, and roll through those when they, when they hit and you, you just have some perspective, I think at that point. Totally, totally. So even looking back on a year where a lot of people, and I mean, I have to be sensitive because a lot of the business I do is with Ireland in the UK and people couldn't go five kilometers away, but we were there on the beach right. in, in, in La Paneda. And so, yeah. I, f- I had a similar experience. I mean, I felt very guilty uh, mm-hmm. enjoying myself. I went to the Canaries and mm-hmm. I got out of Dodge basically right in time. They were borders were closing again and the restrictions were being getting tightened and um and we just we just said we just have to i don't know if i can do another and if this might move towards full lockdown again i've got to get out of here we we did the same we went to the canaries and i really genuinely felt i it was great and i loved it but i felt guilty like very often like i because it, it was totally open there. I mean, it sounds like how it was in Tarragona for you. It was just, it felt so like liberating. And it was a great reminder for me, like, oh, this is what life can be like. That's fantastic. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And isn't, that reminder is really important because I think what's happened to a lot of remote first and remote advocates, just to share and personal conversations I've had with peers, is of course the pandemic has made us maybe forget our values. We've had to readjust them. We've had to come back to them again. And there was a point last April where I was nearly going, what, why am I doing this? Like, this is terrible. I'm locked in my apartment working not never the way I chose to work. And, and so it took a little bit of heart and soul searching, if that makes sense as well, to come back to my values. Mm-hmm. And we touched on this on our pre-conversation. One of the other reasons I choose the way I work and how I work and my values is not just to be able to move and to live in different places and take my family with me and all those things we've already discussed it's also to choose the hours I work and try and work smarter so that I'm not exhausted (laughs) when it gets to a Friday then I you know and that's part of why I do what I do as well and I think that's weaved into it in terms of values as well does that make sense yeah yeah I mean I've said to some other people that I've I I got into remote work and location independence because of for, for the reason to live where I want to live and to work from where I want to work but I think I've come to appreciate just as much the working when I want to work and and that being able to manage my energy levels and productivity levels and and work when it makes most sense for me and and manage my time like that just makes so much more sense for me and my client employer whatever like they get the best of me as well so i don't i think that i think we our cultures like the the irish and americans are are very similar in a, in a lot of ways and um and one of those is like we're kind of like weekend warriors like we we work for the week and we work hard, grind it out, work hard, play hard kind of thing. And then in your country, it's like, go to the pub or, you know, in our country, it's whatever. But like we go, we go and we, 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 we live for the weekend and it's unfortunate to, to have that kind of five to two it ratio. It totally, but actually I'm a bit more, maybe because I've lived a, a more years kind of out of Ireland and in other countries. So I lived in Scotland for quite a significant amount of time, mm. lived in Indonesia for nearly two years on and off uh, in Bali. So a family there. Rowan, uh, we're going to need more time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you're, ta- you're speaking my language. 
<laughs> but um, and then the four years in Spain, I've kind of made up the Rowena way of taking all those things because I totally agree with you. I, I, I sort of like I don't tend to work a Friday afternoon to share, and anyone who works closely with me knows that. Um, you know, I will work hard Monday to Thursday, but. Uh, like just to share openly and say it, I want to try and go down to three days. Yeah, I want yeah. to try and go down to three good days. I don't know if it's four hour a day or four, but I can sort of see. I'd love to go with a Monday or a good part of Monday off, mm-hmm. or maybe just looking at L and D for myself, or so, like learning and development for myself. I have that aim of working smarter and trying to actually, because of my position, say this is how I do it and visibly do it. Be yeah. visible in terms of that, um, but also to weave in the travel with it, uh, and, I'm, and, I, and I know you know this, but I was kind of excited earlier in the week and I had to share with you, because again, I haven't been away since uh, outside of our region in Aragon since last summer. And for most people, the, the people are probably saying, oh, tough, tough luck there. Right. But uh, <laughs> for me, that's a long time. But I'm going over to Madeira to see Gon- Gonzalo and join the Digital Nomad Village there in May for a week. Got a bit nice. of work going on there. And that, that's, you know, these are the things, this is why I do this. If, if I didn't have the solopreneur type of setup I have, I might not be able to do that because not all employers would support that. And also hoping to be in person again with Nacho Rodriguez in Las Palmas like you've been over the summer. So that's our plan at the moment. So I really walk the talk. We are saying to ourselves as a family, and I'm saying most weeks I'm saying, how can I go? How can I get somewhere? How can I weave in work? How can I add to my cultural experiences and and build on that? Yeah, so much is about the the feeling of that freedom. And if you have a bit of nomad in you, you you really can't shake that. I think it's just like, like I, I when we were in the Canaries, it was the first time we'd traveled in over a year. Um, actually, funny enough, you mentioned coming back from having to rush back to Ireland. So you were back home at the beginning of the pandemic. I was as well. I was on my way to San Francisco for a conference and stopped over in Florida in Miami to see my parents. And that was at the beginning of the pandemic. They were closing the borders in Spain. I had to come rushing back. And I think I flew back on right around March 15th also. So interesting that we uh, we both had that same experience. But anyway, the going to the Canaries really reminded me. That was my first trip in, in well over a year. And I was you know, I was reminded like, oh yeah, I ha- I have to move more. I have to, I'm, I crave, you know, travel and seeing new places and it's what recharges my batteries. And a lot of people, it sounds like you were the same during the quarantines and lockdowns. We leaned into work a lot as like our escape because you're trapped in your house and you're just like, well, I'm just going to work and I'm going to work really hard. And as you mentioned, there was tons of opportunity for you. Mm-hmm. We were also getting lots of uh, lots of requests for help with remote work stuff. And I just found that was my my outlet and it led to a lot of burnout. And you mentioned you mentioned before there were lots of laughs and tears. It was like some of the best time and the worst time. And so I think a lot of people experience this and it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how these next couple of months shake out. Totally, totally. But I think what I also think it's and, and discussing with you is helping to kind of get a little picture in my head. There's something in the whole area of well-being where I work in, um, in remote work, where we talk about the well-being wheel and helping people understand how well-being fits into their overall work. Oh. You know, and, and within that diagram, you put in life. Yeah. Okay, you put in life around it often. Is this but is I, this sort of like the the spokes of the wheel kind yeah, of concept? Yeah, oh, I love yeah, this analogy. Yeah, explain yeah, this yeah, for us for yeah, for anybody well, that might not be familiar with it. Well, well, I won't go into the exact detail of the well being wheel, but if you imagine <laughs> when you're working with a client, um, and we can share, I can share a link to it actually in the show notes. Yeah. But where you're working in a client, you often with a client, you often outside that well being wheel put in other factors or build in life because we talk about the holistic person, the holistic worker. And I was just thinking, talking to another nomad, our values of travel, we're, they're just, they're, we're, they're, they're part of it. Why we, like, it's so fundamental to yeah. why we do it. It is personal. It is, it does lean over into personal life because it's how you work to have that work-life integration. And so when I work with clients or look at the wellbeing wheel, I know when I look at it for myself, I put in that freedom to travel in there in that mm-hmm. mix. Yeah. I, pick, I put in what you said that 
that ability to choose how I'm going to work in the day, work smarter, work best, how are my energy levels? And like, we're actually blessed to have that choice. But I do believe, Chase, going forward, more people will have that choice. And I do believe frameworks like the well-being wheel will help people, especially if they're visual, yeah. <laughs> and like diagrams, organize that thinking and come back to it for their for their best application. I, I I'm pretty sure that if if not if it wasn't one of the main reasons, it was definitely a it was a key reason coming across the well being wheel years and years ago was one of the main reasons I kind of made like a big life change because I realized that you know they use the example of like if it was spokes in the wheel and one of them was gone completely or broken, then the wheel wouldn't work at all, and I yeah. kind of felt like a broken wheel. Like of the ten spokes, I had eight or nine of them, but I needed to complete that wheel. And, uh, and, and that part that was missing for me was actually less travel. It was more, uh, international immersion. Like I needed to be surrounded by people with different accents and different languages and different food. And I needed that to be like a core part of my day to day. I, mm. I thought I wanted change a lot. I've, I came to realize over a couple years of like moving constantly that what I really wanted was just like the immersion and, yeah, you know, travel from there. So that's what we've come to have here in in Spain now. And I think it's funny you and I both found Spain and for totally different reasons, but both came here and and really found like a place that we love. It, it's uh, it's been a really special place. We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you in partnership with my friends over at Lamont & Co. If you're planning a retreat, off-site, or group gathering of any kind this year, I highly suggest tapping into their extensive knowledge and experience to help you find the best possible venue for your event. I work with Kim, who has become my trusted advisor when it comes to planning any event around the world, and she's literally saved me hundreds of hours of work and has located venues I never would have found on my own. She even provides me with budget breakdowns and cost estimates for each location I'm interested in and negotiates contract terms on my behalf, all for free. If it sounds too good to be true, I thought the exact same thing at first, but I can assure you this is the real deal. Lamont is paid by the venues, not by you. So there's no cost, risk, or obligation here. So do yourself a favor and contact Lamont via the link in the show notes when you're planning your next group, retreat, offsite, or gathering. If you've made it this far into the episode and you're still enjoying yourself, then I would love to ask a quick favor. Open up the app that you're using to listen to this podcast and leave a quick review. You can do this in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and really just about any platform that allows podcast listening now. If you can't find that in the interface of the app, then scroll down in the show notes and find ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, and you should be able to leave it from there. Thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it and hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Okay, now back to the episode. Yeah, it is, it's so welcoming. And then again, to, keep, to bring the family element in, because there might be people listening, because people often ask, how are you traveling with, you know, with yeah. the, how are you moving with the child? And, yeah, and, expand and on go, that, please. Because yeah, like, I, think, I think this is something that holds, I, I hear it all off, like all the time, like, oh, I would, I would love to do that. I, I also work remotely, but, you know, I have, I have a two-year-old or something and, and yeah. people can do it. It's, it's, they can do it. And I mean, we did, as I said, the, the, the personal story for me is that necessity. Then we're here and she's three and a half. And the next thing we know, literally within the year, turning the first year when she was just turning four and a half, she had been quiet and only speaking English and the explosion happened. And she's totally fluent with Spanish, <laughs> with an Aragonese accent, right? And the hands going. And like when we talk about chop, chop of the dados, she's like there with the hands. She's always when she's eating. And she, she loves everything. She loves Spanish cuisine so much. Hopefully you, you, you'll get this because she's blonde, right? She's oh, yeah. Totally blonde. My husband is really fair. And my mother is really fair. She's white blonde hair. She hasn't got two light eyes, but of course, all the Spanish are like Rubio, Rubio. Like I <laughs> love her. But she goes into the tapas bar and she asks for Hildas, which are the local uh, pepinos and anchovies, the really vinegary ones, which yeah. kids don't tend to eat. And she's there eating the little blonde. <laughs> And it just cra it cracks the locals up, and she's there with the Aragonese accent. So, look, like that's that's the beauty of it. When you stand back and see your child culturally integrated, but you also 
see her in a school and she's in a local school, she's not in a private school, really important to point this out to people mm -hmm. because this is the difference when you integrate as a non-expat. I yeah. want to say that as well because uh, it takes away that dollar sign so much. There's a lot of you know, th thinking that it has to be private. She's in a local school. Her class has nine different languages. There's actually a Taiwanese child there. There's, there's Chinese. There's Latinos, po Russians. Po I mean, and wow. she talks about all these different countries. And I get so happy. Jeez, it just makes my day because just to explain where I come from in Ireland. <laughs> like we, I, my original background, and even my partners would have, wouldn't have been multi, multicultural in the seventies and eighties. That's why I started traveling because I wanted that. I wanted to meet other cultures. So I think, I think that picture in your head of what you want as well, when you become location independent and because she so and but to clarify she is seven she does need education mm -hmm. so we do and i do put a caveat and explain this to people we did choose to not have a mortgage here intentionally to actually look at it not too crazy rent mm -hmm. right because we move around during the holidays a lot so we have to look at financially it would be crazy to have this massive commitment rent wise in our in our in our base we call it our base saragossa but she needs to be schooled and we want her to integrate. And so she does go to school. We don't homeschool her. We don't travel because on the scale of families traveling just to whet people's appetites and get on to clubhouse if you want to meet them. I mean, there's families sailing in the Caribbean, for example, homeschooling on boats. Yeah. So we're not like we're not the total out there extreme example. Right. Right, you but you're, you're like the entry point into this world. Yeah, you know, like, it it's very accessible. <laughs> exactly. But of course, uh, her education is important, so we've chosen that. And then that piece around her being open to, to throw her into any situation, because she's an only child, but she is, of course, very sociable. She is independent. And we can drop her in to a situation, for example... In, in Salau, the first day the group she was in, just by chance in the summer camp, were all speaking Catalan. Wow. And, uh, and, and she came home and she said, oh, I didn't understand all of it, but we just used our hands and it was fine, Mum. <laughs> and I just What went, an education. <laughs> because... Amazing. You know, but, but yeah. So, this, so I guess the summary of that is just to, just to encourage people to be brave and you can do it with the family. If that's what your heart once do it because it is it is a wonderful way to live and and i just for me i'm happy to be an advocate and speak to anyone especially any parent that wants to discuss it on a one-to-one -one because i really do believe we're creating the open-minded global citizens of the future by doing this with our families yeah i, I and it's people like you that i've met throughout my journeys into different places that have have taken their their whole life, kids, jobs, everything on the road, and and tried new places that really inspire me to say like it, it all it's possible if you want if there's a will there's a way sort of thing and uh, and you shouldn't let any one element of your life completely hold you back from following your dreams and and on the contrary like overcoming some of those challenges can present you with tons of new opportunities look at look at the experience your daughter's getting like. Now she's picking up a little bit of Catalan randomly <laughs> one summer, you know, like she's going to have that for the rest of her life. So exactly. there's, there's just so much to be gained from, from stepping out of the comfort zone. Right. Exactly. And, and yeah. And then, I mean, the only, the only other thing that I would say to people is that, you know, because it's often the brain then that kicks in, doesn't it? It's the logistics. It's the, oh, how could I do it? And you said it, right? It's very interesting because you actually said, you said the entry point. And I've had a few personal friends as well who said, we're going to just try a summer, regardless of them having a mortgage or whatever they're saying. And, and I also want to try and be an advocate for that, given your kid, if you are tied to a certain place and you do have the mortgage and you have to stay, just be a bit more open-minded about longer working holidays, about four weeks where, you, you know, the two weeks maybe where you share childcare, et cetera, et cetera. And actually the market and the, and the nomad, the wider nomad marketing community is responding to that with co-livings that welcome children. I know there's one in Valencia, et cetera, et cetera. So, the chances are there for people yeah. to explore it. 
and and still managed to do it even partially, Chase. And I think that's something that I really want to also say to people, just give it a go. But I'm hoping when things relax, we all get the vaccine, that there'll be a rush to that. Yeah. I, I imagine there there will be people have there's a much larger percentage of the population that has this newfound freedom and um, and people are going to be eager more than ever to take advantage of that. What uh, you mentioned things like Clubhouse and some online communities. Are there any specific places that aspiring families, aspiring nomadic families should should go to any web pages or communities there, online? There- there is, but I can't remember the exact, there is one, and we can share it in the notes. I can't Perfect. remember the exact name of it just now, and I haven't written it down. Um, but we can share that in the notes. There is a platform, especially for families, and then there is, you don't want to be on on there. There are different ways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you also follow, follow Nomad Skillshare website. Okay. That, um, that there's, this, there's family groups off of that. There's forums. Uh, I mean, within it, it's a growing market. So what's also interesting is where you are. So if you're in Europe and you're looking at Europe, if you're in Asia, also go down that kind of looking at the location angle to find maybe others that have had similar experiences. And then, as I said, the other way to encourage people is just to look at like a summer holiday or an Easter break Mm -hmm. where you put in particularly in Europe, there's already like co-living for families and look at different dis- destinations because you can start to, to, to look at ways of integrating. One of the things that's interesting about families and integrating with families, that people, like people used to ask me the first year in Spain, how did you learn, you know, how did you learn your Spanish so quick or how did you integrate? And I have to say, and you know, when you have a kid and they're in a school, you have to go to the school gate, you have to speak to the school secretary who doesn't speak English, you know. So you're, you're, you're sort of, you're forced to network even more and meet mm-hmm. people, right? So take that into your holidays. So here's what I mean. Look at places that have kids camps, that have hotels mm-hmm. with kids groups, because suddenly by joining in and being a little bit more proactive, you also start to meet the locals that way. They're not all tourists. So that's one of the things, a couple of families that I've recommended that went for, say, a month, one family that went for a month to Gran Canaria, and then they used a, a local kids camp mm-hmm. and uh, because they speak English, as you know, as well. But they've met some other families that way, and, and that that's, can be the way to do it through your children's activities. Oh, that's such good advice. I would never have thought of that. E- even when you mentioned the the thing in Tarragona with, with your daughter going to the camp there, I th- my initial thought was like, that's a random thing. Like, like I didn't think that that's like, Oh, that's, that's something you can just do, you know, like (laughs) everywhere you go. I had somebody, yeah. I I had somebody ask me about that with, uh, with like, we we have a a Siberian Husky and he, we can send him to a kind of like a doggy daycare when we go travel, but talking to a non pet owner, they were, they were like blown away by this concept. And when I, when I was just kind of mentioning it randomly, like, yeah, this guy comes in with his van, he picks up my dog, he takes him out to the compo and they play with other dogs and it's, it's great. And he's like, this exists. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forget that's not common knowledge. So it's, it's crazy. You, that rolls off your tongue so easily, but um, yeah, that's great information. Yeah, and actually, uh, one of my contacts in Gran Canaria has Whippet dogs, and she said what really helped her integrate. So here's another through through her pets was the dog f- finding a regular time at the local dog park, exactly meeting other dog owners. <laughs> like, so you so, use your hobbies. You use your hobbies. Oh, my child is my hobby, but you use your hobbies and your things that you're doing, and just be a little bit more proactive there. And and you can start to find those ways too. Absolutely. It's funny because I wasn't going to draw the comparison to the dog park because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to do the, oh, I understand what you're talking about as a parent. I'm, I'm a dog dad, you know, Uh, (laughs) (laughs) but it is what you said is very true uh, about the dog park. I I go to a dog park close by and I use it as an opportunity. Sometimes I I have like a little thing on my, on my to-do list to do like 30 minutes of at least 30 minutes a day of talking in Spanish because I'm working in English. My wife and I speak English. Um, you know, like it could be possible for me to go a whole day easily without speaking any Spanish. So I try to f- make sure to find that time every day to at least do 30 minutes. And 
often that will be the dog park. I can be like, oh, I'm going to take him down there to the park. He can play and I can talk to the other dog parents and, uh, <laughs> and you know, socially distanced, of course, these days. Yeah. But, but, it, but it is a great way to, to practice. And, exactly. Um, and, and that's how you might integrate. So, you know, whether it's traveling, you can travel. Actually, there's even nomad groups, just so you know, for traveling with pets. Yes. Because actually... <laughs> Going to visit, and here's a wonderful example, on the Slack, amazing community that Gonzalo has created in Madeira, and I'm on there now, or Madeira, for going in May. Like, there's a channel for people with pets that have traveled to Madeira. All the interests are on there. Mm -hmm. So the same thing comes across for families. Look for other families that, you know, want to do the same activities as you, that want to do intercambios of language, whatever it may be, and it will start to happen. But I'm, I really want to encourage people to dip their toe in the water and rethink that holiday time that they have in between school holidays. Because, I mean, it's, that's the only major difference between owning a dog and a child, by the way. <laughs> there might be a few, but... Uh... <laughs> but it's the fact that you have to often look at school holidays if you're not homeschooling in some yeah. way. So we relook at those and say, how can we make it a bit longer if we can remote work or take some extra holidays and then look at how to look, integrate locally. The other thing is with social media and even actually there's a whole community in uh, Las Palmas of, uh, of families of expats and nomads. And you can reach out and offer to connect with people beforehand. And there's lots of ways of of setting up those important connections before you Ab go. Absolutely, yeah. You'll you'll be people are always surprised how quick and easy it is to to form a community. The digital age makes that pretty pretty straightforward. You know, a couple of Google searches and and you're there. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's actually a, a nice segue because I do want to get into some of your work and advocacy at, around remote work and some of the things that you're working on and planning. I was I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and I there was this quote on there that I thought was really really nicely said. You said remote work has enabled me to live in many countries, travel extensively and find work-life balance. I relish in being an advocate and a leader on the education and skills needed for effective remote work practices. That really struck me as like that that encapsulates what I knew about you before we had the chance to actually get to know each other and how you've blended all these things together, your work and your life and the advocacy that you do. So you can explain it better than I can. If tell the audience a little bit about what you what you do in the day to day around remote work. So what I did in the day to day of pre March last year, uh, there's been a big change in the last sort of 12, 14 months due to the pandemic. But I, I was with the university, as I said, before I left Dublin, I was uh, delivering various courses, mainly around communications, digital communications. And when I came to Spain, I approached them again and said, I mean, about a year in, I said, look, I really think this virtual skills, virtual working, I'm doing it now. I had a, a one small client as we were settling into Spain and a, a project that was ongoing. And I said, why don't we look at developing a course? And that university has been so supportive to me, Technical University of Dublin um, and two academics there that I work with and still work with. In 2019, we put on, which is, it's like dog years, like loads of years of remote work. <laughs> But uh, we put on we put on an event, a physical event in Dublin called Management Strategies for Remote Working, and out of that became a came a course, and that's been the core start of the the sort of the roots of my work. So that academically accredited course is one of the few in the world. It's a level eight in remote work skills and future of work. Has been in place for nearly you know, two years now. It's got exam board. It's got uh, accreditation. I work on it. I deliver it with the team remotely in Dublin, and I'm really, I'm really proud of it because there's there's very few that have been university accredited in the world, and that up until March was there. It was tipping away. I had a couple of other remote projects I was working on. March kicked in, and what happened then was the Irish Health Service approached us because it was a call for help, because lots of their staff were sent home and they knew that course existed, Chase. And what we then did is we reacted and created the biggest remote working accredited course in Europe with 2,200 health service workers wow. going through that course, built on Moodle. 
Uh, I got a president, the president of Ireland sent me a personal video message. It was like a really amazing moment for me after with a lot of hard work. But what came out during those four months was the need for balance, self-leadership, self-management and well-being. And that's where a lot of my personal work in terms of my solopreneur and my projects has moved since then. What do you so, what do you mean by that exactly? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so when we were delivering the live course to the 2200 cohort, mm-hmm. we had built it and there was live master classes and support sessions. And some of these people, just to give you an idea, were health service workers that were working in local clinics in rural Ireland that had only ever used a desktop and were really low in digital literacy. They were sent home, for example, with a tablet and suddenly were having to remote work. So apart from the basic skills of how to use the tablet, how to use the computer, how to plug in a headset, all those things, actually, they didn't even know how to structure their day. Yeah. Okay. And so what kicked in, and we've already spoken about this, is they were overworking, they were stressing, they hadn't their workspace set up. When we brought in ergonomics, we spoke about balance, calendar management. We spoke about reflective writing. I have my writing here that I show you that I do most mornings because reflective practice is a big part in academic education in terms of how you digest things. And interestingly, Chase, bringing looping it back to the well-being wheel, whenever I apply that for myself, I do it in writing. Mm. rather than electronically just my personal preference but i think that it's there's a lot to be learned there by sitting and writing without distractions of technology without those things um so what we learned from that live in in the moment in those four months is that people really needed that well-being work-life balance element there was huge demand so the way my work has moved since then so fast-paced in the last 12 months is a lot of my work with clients is actually EAPs, big insurance companies, where I provide remote work skills. I now have a team of associates. I'll deliver that through, but with a strong emphasis on well-being and well-being management through calendar management, through routine, all of that stuff, but really practically. So we don't tell people how to do it. We show people how to do it in a mentoring format. So there's seminars I run, workshops, but there's a whole load of one-to-one mentoring that I'm building out. And for example, if you said to me, uh, you know, I know the tools at Deweese as well, there's great tools there. But if you said to me, I don't know how to calendar block, right? I don't know what you mean. I'm not going to go, here's a picture of my calendar blocking. I'm going to go, let's share screens, show me your Google Calendar, whatever you use. Let's come up with a color code and let's start blocking together. Right. Right. Giving people that that confined space to do their certain types of work and helping them be more productive throughout the day, because otherwise you've just thrown them to the to the wolves. I mean, you you send somebody home with a tablet that that doesn't know how to open a laptop and and tell them to work from home. They've got the the deck stacked against them. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, and there's also, I mean, there is there is a psychological, of course, element to it too that they have to realize as well that if they're sat at that tablet or at that laptop for eight hours without a break, they're not going to be productive. And 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 you and I, we know that, but do we really know it? I I had to remind myself of it during the pandemic. Sure. You mentioned burnout, and when you know a little bit about the psychology, we often need a bit of accountability. And I know, for example, in your work that you you would look at in, in your team supporting each other. I see the posts on LinkedIn. I know you guys get that. Yeah. That you need to also remind staff through your culture, through to not overwork. Here, take your holidays, take your breaks. But this isn't you know? the norm, right? I mean, it's kind of the the exception to the rule. And unfortunately, I, I think more, I have the impression that more companies are coming around. There's more people like yourself pushing for this mental health in the workplace is becoming a a topic of regular conversation people are taking it seriously and and you know the work life balance is a phrase that's been around for a while but i feel like it's taken on a new meaning where people actually mean it when they say it and not not just they're not just words anymore and and so i'm seeing a shift and I, I would want i'm curious to hear if you are too that that companies like i i am proud to say i believe duis does this really well and i i just see other companies also doing it more often, but it still isn't the norm 
to really push your employees not to work. Like, like we feel actually at Duis, like our probably our biggest challenge is like keeping people from working too much because you hire excellent people that are go getters that want to work hard, that want to produce, and you sit them at home alone in their in their silos they're going to lean into their work like we all did during the pandemic. And so even the most seasoned remote workers, the people who have experience, who have set up their processes and stuff, were rocked by the pandemic and were were found doing... You were working at home with your seven-year-old. That's not the norm for you. So much less for somebody who's been used to being held accountable in an office with their counterparts all around them all day, every day for the last 30 years or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, so to just answer that in two ways, the World Economic Forum have come out and said, and we can share the link in the notes, that well-being is a skill. It's okay? a skill. And that's great. I have not. I had not seen that. That's a. That's a yeah, very cool, bold yeah. statement. And is and therefore, if we suddenly go, it's a skill. I'm not going to figure it out overnight. I have to look at learning it, practicing it, embedding it, and then coming back to it constantly. Right. Same way any, you know, a project manager is going to top up their training. A developer is going to look to top. This is the same thing. If we believe well-being is important, we have to build it into L&D. We have to build it the whole way through the organization. That's the first thing I'm going to say. Then the second thing I'm going to say, and I will supply it in the links as well, is we have to be really creative in extreme and extraordinary circumstances, which, of Mm. course, this pandemic has been, and you and I have just discussed that, in topping up our self-care. Right. Yes. And looking at it. So that worker that you drew the picture of there, and it's really true, this high performance that you guys probably have on your team, developer, or tech or whoever it is, really well set up, you know, really good at their job, wouldn't normally tend to overwork. Suddenly they're restrained, they're stressed, they can't go outside, do, do, do. What, what can, what can, how can you help them? You need to keep reminding them they have to find new ways to top up their self-care and there's been hints of this in the media bakery has been popular people are doing paint by numbers people are gardening on their terrazzas suddenly we are reconnecting with our hands in another way that we never did and that is it they need to build out that profile and any conscious organization can help them do that by supporting it through suggestion funding organizing maybe some like supervised painting classes that are online but then the person goes off and paints in their own time right whatever there are lots of ways and encouraging people to build out that creativity it is all around creativity for some people it is sports but sports again is physical but what i've found and i'll share in the link is enhancing your self-care and revisiting that is really important for for, for for everyone and then like even i've taken up mandala drawing like with my daughter <laughs> <laughs> but but we do it together a couple of times a week and yeah yeah we did it during the lockdown we still do it now and so you know it's, just ex- extending it out <laughs> there's a, there's a lot to be said for uh for having any kind of a side project this this podcast actually is for me like was a is a side project something that i wanted to do for a, a while and you mentioned early on that like some some elements of the pandemic obviously there's horrible situation for the world but there if you look for the silver linings you know people found time to reconnect with certain things or find new artistic creative outlets or or you know rekindle relationships with people and and so it's provided some opportunities like that and i think having a a side project or some something that gives you an outlet outside of work is more important than ever when you're restricted exactly and and can organizations can teams support that in any way like uh, one example on my team here uh, my associate team here one of the (laughs) one of the of my teammates is in madrid and she's really keen to learn spanish so when we do uh, our social chats, we're only every few, you know, we speak a bit in Spanish. We have a little bit of Spanish on our Slack channel because that's her passion as she's been in the lockdown in Madrid. So try, I mean, they, these are just little individual examples, but that, that's what I mean. You know, that's share a little Spanish anecdote, share some, anything that's not, because it's not what work related. It's nothing to do with our day to day work because that's all right. in English. But again, it's tapping into that little bit of taking people away from just work 
um, uh, when you're out this weekend, find a funny Spanish sign that you see on the street in Madrid that makes you laugh. Actually, we have to talk about that T-shirts with English. Have you noticed that? Well, you oh, know. yeah. People <laughs> people don't mind putting a, an F-bomb on a T-shirt, not really understanding what it means. <laughs> When, my, when we were first here, the first year, my partner and I, this is such a tangent, we were saying if we were on Instagram, which we're not, and we cared, we could have created this such a cool Instagram of all the bad English teachers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I always wonder, like, uh, s- sometimes at the gym I go to, I, I often see people with, with these shirts with, like, horrible things written in English on them. And I'm like, oh, do you, do you know what that means? <laughs> <laughs> but um but you know i'm not going to be the the bearer of bad news i guess but yeah you're right this would make a great a great uh instant handle <laughs> exactly exactly so well i you know so that's well-being as a scale and then just looking at that full self-care as for yourself as an individual because all of this has to start with yourself you have to make sure your own bucket is full all the little things that you do matter and then bring it back to your team if you're a leader lead by practice share about the dog park chase share about the you know the the intentional ways that you were looking at topping up by doing the podcast and you're demonstrating it by practice and 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 just try and realize that in extreme circumstances we need to be more intentional i mean intentional is used in remote work all the time isn't Mm -hmm. it as a phrase but actually intentional and putting attention to your intention is really a mindful thing. And when you look at mindfulness, it's all really related. And that's what's interesting for me because that's another side passion of mine and how we can just be more mindful as we do our work and be better at doing it, be more healthy, be more balanced. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of room for improvement there, even from the the best of companies and the most prepared of individuals that, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a time to, to refocus and and realign with that intention and figure out how to show up as the best version of yourself. I mean, you owe it. I think about it. You owe it to your clients or to your family or to your uh, to your employer to to take a step back sometimes to make sure that you can show up as the best version of yourself. And if if your company doesn't embrace that, then you know that 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 can be a challenge but maybe you need to reassess where where your loyalties lie then and there's there's lots of opportunities there's lots like like I said there's lots of companies that are transferring to this mindset and adopting sort of new age practices of the way that they're treating their employees and I I think there's there's more opportunity than ever for for this sort of thing Exactly and the only thing I would add to yourself is you, you sum that up really nicely really way like the way you say that but you at the first point you owe it to yourself to turn up in your best version yeah you're right yourself because when you you have that mirror to yourself it really then it all it it will come out hopefully authentically it will come out naturally to who you engage with absolutely yeah well well said great great point um and uh I feel like we could probably do a couple hours just on this remote work stuff so i'll i'll cut us short before we uh, go down too many rabbit trails before before we wrap up um, with a couple quick questions did you I believe you're working on something did you reference this already that that will be coming out that you want to share with the audience or something that that could be sort of related to this yeah just in terms of the the mentoring model for remote workers that mm-hmm. is in market at the moment I'm, I'm on my team and I are delivering live. Uh, it's evolving because it's only been around for about six months, but it, it, it's, it's pretty much it's pretty much there. We're looking at also an offering that would work for nomads around those skills and mentoring to support nomads, both the real tangible skills like we've spoken about, how to actually calendar block, but also those other more in, intangible, like the attitude, how you turn up your mindset. So I'm hoping to have something in market and that'll be in the notes as well. Okay. Maybe by the time this gets published, so that would be great. But anyone who wants to stay up to date with my work can follow me on LinkedIn, connect on LinkedIn, say hi. And I also have a sign up for a mailing list on my website, ruinahennigan.com. Ruinahennigan.com. Perfect. We'll, we will add all of that to the show notes for sure. Um, in the meantime, uh, I do want to ask a couple quick questions, finishing off coming back to Spain and, and traveling, and then we'll we'll let you go. So speaking again, what would we're speaking again to the audience that uh, is considering traveling with a family 
and to uh, to Spain in particular. Do you have one piece of glaring advice that you would give them if if they're on their way to Spain? They're they're making the move. They've got a young young family, a couple children. Or what what would you perhaps give them as as some advice to adapting? Well, this is the academic coming out a little bit, so I'll answer it from the heart. What I learned about learning Spanish, so assuming that that family really wants to integrate and they're bringing in that language of the destination, particularly in Spain. So I've said already, go for somewhere that's not very expatish if you really want to integrate, so be brave. And hopefully I've given lots of benefits of that. But I would say, look at the way you've learned previously. So what do I mean by that? So a lot of the research shows, particularly for language learning, that there's lots of different ways and there's a little bit of an over-reliance on pure technology. So that what I mean by that is every week, look and say, what are the ways I've tried to engage in Spanish? Have I listened? Have I listened in person, not just on audio? Have I gone and sat in a cafe and listened? Have I, have I spoken? Really important because, again, you can go through a phase of just being listening and not speaking back. Um, and have I read? And look at the ways you're doing that. And again, maybe, uh, you know, not, not on digital screens. And then finally, have I tried to write a little bit? And again, even if it's sending a WhatsApp, even it's writing two sentences each night. Because we all learn in different ways. And in terms of language learning, being clever of those different ways of how you, you're already intentional going to the dog park. But um, how you do that was really something I learned the hard way in the first year. I was very much just going to my classes, wasn't putting it in practice. And, and, and over the four years, I've realized mixing it up with those different ways, the 10 minute walk to the co-working with listening to some audio, but stopping and repeating back something, all those little different ways really pay back. Excellent. That is such a great methodical real life answer that that makes so much sense. And I'm going to think more about that because I don't focus enough on the, the writing aspect i uh i like the talking piece maybe that's why i have a podcast um, but, um that's why i'm not a blogger uh but anyway uh that's that's really great advice and finally touching on saragossa in particular what's the uh you you obviously love it there i i understand that because i've been there but as you mentioned it's not one of the the kind of hot button spots on the on the nomad list it's not somewhere that maybe when someone's thinking of moving from from another country they're not thinking of saragossa so you i'm not asking you to sell it but what is it that you love so much about saragossa and and what what my why might you suggest someone else give it a shot as a place to live it's a really really welcoming city and i've lived in some of the most welcoming cities in the world including glasgow and galway where i was born which would often be on lists is very welcoming but saragossa given my experience, it was extremely welcoming. It's very navigatable. The river runs through it. The basilica is a very, so you can get orientated really quickly. So there'd be two, these are two really practical things. Arguably the best tapas in Spain. Arguably, I mean, like, but I'll, I'll give you a reason why I can justify that. The Spanish come here to eat tapas. There's a massive internal Spanish tourism to the, to, to Zaragoza for the tapas. Uh, access to the mountains and the Pyrenees is a really good place location wise you're an hour and a half from Barcelona Madrid on the fast train and then the final thing specifically for families it's an amazing city for kids mm -hmm. amazing city for kids loads of green spaces amazing amount of activities anything anything Irish there's an Irish Gaelic uh, sports team here is there really like yeah there actually is right so my daughter could, could go and learn if she wanted to there's a rugby team i i have never in all the it is so much for children and one of the things to add for people listening that i love about spain culturally in general for children is children are welcome everywhere they're welcome everywhere at nine o'clock at night if you go in and sit and you're having a beer and a tapa your child is welcome They'll be given a drawn pad. They'll be asked in behind the bar uh, to meet the locals, whatever. So people miss that in terms of integration in Spain. It's an extremely family-friendly place. And we've met so many people just casually because we have a child and they come and speak to us. 
I mean, I know she's blonde, so it does help Chase, but it's, it's, it's seriously very, very welcoming and an amazing place for families. So if you were considering Spain, I highly recommend you look at Zaragoza and I hope I've given some other good reasons because <laughs> it's not, as you say, it's underrated. It is, it is underrated. It is absolutely underrated. And what's the what's the sort of uh, labyrinth area in the center of town called? It's uh, uh, El Tubo. El, El Tubo. Tubo. Yeah, it's yeah. super cool. It's like a, like a just windy little alleyways of bars and restaurants, yeah. and it's very very just just a it's a very pleasant place to be. And that access to that quick access to the mountains, quick access to some of the biggest cities. You can also get to the north of Spain. I mean, I, I in the from the south of Spain. The south of Spain has a lot of culture and and ar- the architecture is unique and you have the ocean and which, you know, the Mediterranean is beautiful. But when you get inward in Spain, you realize how like how far the south feels from the north and from where you are, you can access, you could be in Basque country and and, and in the Pyrenees, you can be in Barcelona, Madrid, you're yeah, at the French exactly. border. It's amazing. I mean, it's 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 a really beautiful part of the world. It really is, and Pamplona is an hour away. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of sp- na- people might know other names of what's nearby other than Zaragoza itself. So yeah, I mean, I could talk about the benefits of Zaragoza yeah. for hours. <laughs> but uh, come and visit and see for yourself. Yeah, <laughs> you everybody listening, you'll just have to go visit and see for yourself. Um, and also, I just want to kind of echo your point about children. Obviously, I don't have children here, but I'm also really impressed with the way the Spanish don't separate the like adult life from children life so much you you there's like you said like you can be in a in a in a bar which might sound weird to some people but like the the kind of tapasy bar life is is really i mean you could go and just have a coffee and a croissant in a bar as well it's not just for drinking alcohol but like the kids are there the kids are playing around the people people show up with full families and it's it's not this separation of activities so much and I, I really love that it, it makes it feel like a very wholesome like family environment uh, exactly and, and and I mean if anyone's listening who's from Ireland and of course the climate comparison is terrible Ireland does not win <laughs> but also we wouldn't have such an outdoor lifestyle and that's what I was hinting at with Sp- Spain it's not just that the it's so welcoming for families there's lots to do the design of the spaces the green spaces here the terraces the parks it's unreal. There's yeah. so much outside things and spaces with access to toilets. I mean, yeah. <laughs> for example, with a, a small child, you're going to be thinking of that. Changing facilities for a child with diapers or nappies, whatever. All that is really, really good in Spain. And, and it makes outside living so pleasant with yeah. kids. So I, one of my favorite phrases that I learned when I first moved to Spain was like the people say, like, we live in La Calle. You know, we live yeah. in the street. And, and that's the, everything's outside during the pandemic, people learned how to like cook and like, like, Oh, I, I could, I should use this space for more than just sleeping uh, because they're always in the street. They, they live outside, you know, on terraces and, and in the parks and in the outdoor areas. And so everything's kind of designed around that because you have good weather all year. So yes, exactly. But also because of the spaces, there is yeah. an urban planning, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know what I mean like, like so there's so many benches yeah it's only when you go somewhere else you notice this is designed for outside living it is yeah it's everything's outside. built around being outside and yeah and, uh, I've exactly. I've really come to love that I'm like a sucker for the sun now like I, I need sun when it it's drizzling a little bit here today and I'm like what is this what's happening <laughs> It's just because you've been an Irish girl on the podcast, that's why I brought yeah. it. <laughs> you brought it with me. Well, we didn't get to this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> wrap it up. But um, we uh, we have some so many other connections that I made throughout this conversation today. I've Galway is one of my favorite places in the world. My my wife and I have been multiple times. We got engaged there on the cliffs of Moher, oh, and no uh, we spent six months living in Kinvara, south of Galway. So we'll have to talk about that uh, in our next uh, episode. I just enjoyed this so much, Rowena. Like, like I said in the very beginning, we we know each other. We knew each other, but now we really know each other. I love the work that you do and the advocacy that you're all about. And your story is super cool. I think it's going to be really inspirational for young families that want to travel and experience the world and take advantage of the newfound freedom. So thank you for being so open and honest and sharing and, and advocating for everything that you do. It's, it's awesome. 
Thank you so much for the time, Chase. It's been an utter pleasure. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I hope to meet you in person someday, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully we can just meet people in person someday soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Rowita. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. You can visit aboutabroad.com to get our latest updates and listen to past episodes, or find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, really anywhere you get your podcasts. On that note, if you enjoyed the show, feel free to subscribe, and if inclined, leave a few stars and a review. It's truly, truly appreciated and will help more wanderers just like you find us. Until the next time, adios from España.